Good morning, everyone. Um, this is a very, very special day for the, um, for the Lisbon Club and also the Blue Ocean Foundation. Uh, we had um, at the Lisbon Club, I think Tiago will perhaps then speak a bit about the Blue Foundation, uh, Blue Ocean Foundation, that we thank tremendously for this opportunity to, uh, to do something that we think is important to do a crossroads between international relations and geopolitics, and at the same time, ocean conservation sustainability, which is, of course, one of the key issues in the 21st century. Now, I have the lucky spot. I will be moderating two world experts on these areas. I'm just putting the bar really high now. <laughs> and um, I would like to start, first of all, by thanking you really all for coming because Lisbon is in chaos. So you've all made it and we thank you tremendously for that. Now, uh, to my right, I have Paul Rose, one of the most Hi. experienced divers in the world, explorer, scientist, ocean specialist, having been involved in the discovery and the promotion, the awareness of such big challenges that we are now facing in one of the most, in some of the most remote regions in the world. He's also a known presenter in TV and radio. I know his work well. He was also vice president of the Royal Geographical Society and commander of the Eurothera Research Station in Antarctica, where I think you stayed for 10 years. 10 years, yes. Yes, Tell a decade. Whatsoever, as you can a see. A decade <laughs> in the Antarctica. Now, I, I strongly emphasize that you uh, go and see his website, paulrose.org. It's fascinating. When I went there, I was just bewildered with so much, so many activities, so much promotion of our, the Azores, the traveling, all his main activities. My first reaction was, does this man sleep? <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized, yes, because I met him yesterday and he is one of the most energetic and positive persons I have ever met in my life. <laughs> Secondly, um, and it's because it's always the details that make, that make the difference. Uh, one of the things that Paul does, and has nothing to do with oceans, is he's one of the, um, one of the ambassadors of Driven to Extremes charity, mm -hmm. which deals with soldiers, ex-soldiers that are injured and suffering from PTSD and need specialized treatment on their road to recovery. It's not all about doctors, hospitals, or medication. And PTSD has a huge impact on soldiers and their families and society. So that, for me, was like <laughs> the cherry on top of the cake. Now, what I would like, lastly, to emphasize is Paul's willingness to be here with us. He arrived yesterday from Manchester, and he has to leave here at 12.30 to catch a plane back to Manchester and then to South Korea. Yes. <laughs> so as you can see, he, he is really very willingly to be here with us. So we now have a chance to uh, enjoy uh, his expertise. And so with all of this, Paul, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Raquel. Thank you. Tiago. And uh, thanks to all of you. And it, it is good to be here. And I've often wondered why I feel so at home in Lisbon and in Portugal. I never could work it out, but I've been here many times as a sailor and as a diver and, of course, as a, as a tourist. And then luckily, uh, last year, I took a test at National Geographic. Uh, they have these very complex, high-level DNA tests. And then they can take your DNA and send it off to all these laboratories. So it's slightly worrying that my DNA is hanging around in all these laboratories. <laughs> Never know what's going on. And um, then they send you this report, a very detailed report as to where you come from. And I, was, I flicked through all of the, uh, you know, the, the, the first pages, because it's quite technical. And I, got, I wanted to see the map. And me and my ancestors, when we left Africa, Eritrea, we went up north. And some people, as you know, go north over to you know, Scandinavia, which I thought maybe that was me, because I love the cold places. And then I, there's a big group that goes around into Asia. And then my arrow comes around um, into Europe. 
and lands in Portugal. I could barely <laughs> believe it. So, so I was very happy. So, you know, I can hardly claim I'm Portuguese, but there is a reason I'm very happy to be home here. And the other thing that we won't talk, talk too much about is that when it, in the deep analysis, my partner laughed and noticed and was almost rolling around the floor with laughter when she discovered that I have an extraordinarily high amount of Neanderthal man in me. <laughs> um, bigger than they've ever recorded, so I'm gonna go back to do more tests, but it counts for the long arms and, and the sore knuckles on the ground. But, um, so I'm Paul Rose, and I'm trying to be Portuguese, or at least as Azorian, partly because the last expedition that, that I led with Emmanuel and the team was to the Azorias. Uh, I lead something called uh, pristine seas expeditions from National Geographic. We've had 22 expeditions, been able to help create 17 marine protected areas, uh, which add up to over five and a half million square kilometers of protection. Um, and this all came about because of a genius called Dr. Enric Sala, who's a dear friend of mine. He was a professor at Scripps in California one of these young professors. You know, how can you be a professor at 34? But he was. And every science paper he did, every lesson he taught, every step in his academic career, he thought, he one day said, you know what? I'm writing the obituary of the ocean. He didn't feel that this greater knowledge, this greater awareness raising, this greater sense of understanding would ever get to protect the ocean. He was just writing the obituary. So at that time, um, he wasn't part of National Geographic, so he went to National Geographic, explained this, and started something called Pristine Seas with the idea that could he put a team together to go to the last wild places in the ocean? Why not protect them? There's all this awareness raising going on. There's all these science studies going on. There's all of these political battles that were beginning to form at that time. But why not? somehow cut through all of that with a laser focus to protect the last wild pristine places in the ocean. A bit like putting money in the bank, as we call it. You know, we, we put the ocean under a lot of stress. And if we keep removing stuff from the ocean and putting it under stress, something's gonna happen. So let's put money in the bank is how we word it. So he started Pristine Seas. Um, it's a beautiful project because it's the, one of the only projects I know that has the ability and the resources and the will to do all of the political work and reconnaissance work and understanding a long time before the expedition takes place. So many field science projects go, and you know, you know who doesn't love that enthusiasm of just going on an expedition? We all love that, right, you know, I'm, I'm gonna study butterflies in Mozambique because I love butterflies and I've got some Mozambican contacts and I'm off, you know. And then 20 years later, that person is still struggling to try and make a political difference, whereas we, uh, with Enric's leadership and the resources of National Geographic, we really put a lot of effort into all of the political analysis, where the movers and influences might be, where the nudges might occur, and what changes need to happen well before we even go somewhere. And that includes sending people to these places. So then when we go, we know, ah, you know, something is likely to happen. Now, um, these expeditions are all over the place, you know, from Antarctica to the Russian Arctic to all the warm places in between. And a great example is the Azores expedition this year. It came because very fortunately in the Salvagens, two years ago, three years ago to do the Salvagens, I led that expedition and a, and a name appeared on my email, Emmanuel Gonzalez, and, and he was our local man, expert. So we worked together for five minutes and discovered that we're gonna do a lot more. And we had a great expedition in the South Argens. Um, and then this led to the Azores. So we didn't have to do much on our side from National Geographic to make the Azores happen, except, you know, it really opened my eyes that we have to, to you know, to use the term, there really is Hawaii in Europe. Mm -hmm. You know, it really is, does exist. And, you know, it, you know, what next? Well, we've done the science, we've made the film, we've made all the contacts, we've told everybody all about it, and now it sits with the political process and the diplomatic leadership and business leadership to, to actually get the Azores signed in as a, as a, as a large-scale, global-leading marine protected area. And on the surface of it, it couldn't be simpler, because I've never seen such an, you know, 
opportunistic and opportunity with the ocean right now. It's, it's a hugely optimistic time. I mean, who would have thought we'd see the day where you've got the UK government have an official Twitter account, and it's called UK Blue Belt, and they pop up on my Twitter every day with news about the UK waters and the UK overseas territories. And yesterday they announced the UK government that they're going to protect 30% of our waters by 2030. And that, to me, feels like global leadership. And yet, <coughs> my colleagues in, in government would admit that five years ago they never would have foreseen that, that on Twitter you would be announcing big commitments. And these are global leading commitments. And all of us here, you know, we do attend these big international ocean conferences. And in the past years, it's almost become a competition where global leaders will stand and say, we are going to protect 10% of this, or we have established this MPA of this size, and someone else, well, we have established that. And they, that sense of healthy competition exists about the ocean. Who would have thought it? I mean, when I started diving in 1969, I was energized by the fact that we didn't know anything about the ocean. Mm -hmm. I love the thought that it was the, the largest, least protected, least understood ecosystem on the planet, and I was a little speck swimming around in it. That was exciting for me. But now I'm excited that as we begin to understand it, we realize that we have affected it negatively, and there's a time for action right now. We really are at a tipping point, but we've got the tools to do it. We couldn't have had these commitments for large-scale marine protected areas if we didn't have satellite surveillance. No one has money for a fleet of fisheries patrol vessels, you know, boots on decks as we call it, people driving around the ocean who can only see three or four miles away and on the radar chasing fast professional illegal fishing. But now we have satellite surveillance. And it works, I've seen it work, and it's not difficult for wealthy countries to have satellite surveillance, and it's also quite simple for developing countries or p countries that don't quite have the money for the surveillance to be supported by others and big NGOs to get satellite surveillance. So this really works. We really can see what's going on. And then, only recently, we had something called the Port State Measures Agreement come in. And that um, is the thing that we've now got 52 or 53 countries signed up for it. Um, we used to think we would be lucky to get 20. And it means that this international law is the first time that there is a law specifically focused on illegal, unregulated and unreported fishing, which means that a vessel, say a British vessel, could come into Portuguese waters that were protected. We would see it moving around and perhaps they would turn off their AIS and any other instruments. They would move around thinking they weren't being seen gather their fish or work alongside a, a bigger vessel for transferring vessels, yeah. and then drive all the way to, say, Valparaiso and try and sell the fish. Before it was impossible. Now we can see them doing it. We can analyze on uh, um, the uh, satellite surveillance the movements they made at sea, whether they were conducive to long lining or being in support of another group of fishing vessels. We can tell when they get to Valparaiso, and we can prosecute that ship. So this is revolutionary. And only uh, last week, I think it was, the UN has agreed to look at the high seas and within two years to come up with a new high seas agreement. Yeah. And with you know, Tiago's background and, and a whole other group of smart uh, legal people, we're now in the business of having enforceable environmental law <coughs> that is gonna bring uh, people to justice for not looking after the planet first. So I'm massively excited about um, the ocean. I don't think we can all sit back and just let it happen. It's going to be great. We need to keep the, the pressure on and the focus on. But I believe that within my lifetime, for sure, we are going to see vast amounts of the ocean protecting and a new, new way of thinking where it really is nature first and not nature happens to be the responsibility of someone else. It's nature first. And I think that's where we are. So I'm, you're right. I'm optimistic. Yes, you are. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was a very uh, optimistic and brilliant introduction to our theme. <laughs> okay. um, uh, our second um, illustrious speaker is Tiago Piti Cunha. We all know him. 
He has been working in the last two decades in the area of ocean policies, whilst uh, a legislator in the UN, in the government of Portugal, in the European Commission. Tiago has been the face that we usually uh, associate <laughs> with not just the oceans in Portugal, but what the oceans means and can do for Portugal, and even in terms of our identity. He has promoted the, imp the strategic importance of maritime issues, which I think is one of the key points he will bring us, not only for Portugal, but also for Europe as a strategic actor, both in Lisbon and in Brussels. He also wrote this essay, Portugal and the Sea, uh, uh, from, uh, from the collection of the Fundação Francisco Manuel de Sanche. Um, it was just, it was, um, it's a very small essay like all of them, but it's a brilliant book that I strongly uh, encourage you all to read it. For me, it was very important because it enabled me to think about Portugal and the sea in a very, very structured way. Not just the past, not just the discoveries, not something distant, <laughs> but something very present in our daily, daily lives. So, Tiago, with this introduction, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Raquel. I'm really embarrassed uh, with uh, your introduction. I, uh, if you don't mind, I'll speak from here as uh, standing helps me uh, speaking. And, um, and I was going to say uh, that I uh, needed to uh, retribute such kind words and say that we could not imagine a better chairperson for this debate <laughs> as someone that is a professor of international relations mm -hmm. because the theme of the debate is really uh, indeed it's uh, ocean conservation but also uh, geopolitical uh, factors and uh, when we speak about geopolicy or geo strategy we are talking about international relations. Mm -hmm. um, but let me say as well in the beginning uh, how pleased uh, we are, the Ocean Muslim Foundation, for co-organizing this event with the, the Club de Lisboa. And, um, and in fact, uh, uh, how we were challenged by the Club de Lisboa, I have to say, we have to recognize the ownership of the initiative, comes from the Club de Lisboa, that really understood that uh, it was time to do this uh, uh, crossing between uh, ocean, ocean sustainability, ocean conservation, that's what we do at the Ocean Azul Foundation, <laughs> and, um, and, um, and uh, international relations, uh, uh, geopolitics. Of course, that uh, uh, in saying so, I should uh, have a word of thanks to Ambassador uh, Francisco Seixas da Costa, uh, with whom I had uh, the pleasure and the honor to have uh, worked in the United Nations under uh, his leadership when he was perm rep at the UN, uh, Portuguese UN mission. And um, Fernando Cardoso, who has been uh, tirelessly organizing uh, this event with all our team. I see some of our uh, colleagues here, and I thank them very much as well for that. And uh, of course, the, then, um, uh, because uh, what you say, said, Raquel, about Paul, uh, you made my life very easy on that, so I don't need to uh, tell you about Paul. Uh, Raquel spoke, he spoke, so I only need to thank you very, very much you. for all your support, for all your uh, working with the Oceano Azul Foundation, and also for coming uh, at this very tight schedule of yours uh, to Lisbon. Really, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, well, the main focus of um, this brief presentation will be to explain what is the connection between ocean conservation and the geopolicy. Because I don't think that at first sight one will understand the connection. Uh, we know, of course, from our history books that uh, geography always shaped politics and policies and strategies. And uh, we know that uh, uh, relevant states uh, have explored well their geographies uh, and, uh, and, and have developed geo strategies which were at the basis of their fundamental options for political and economic development. And of course, uh, in history, we can also uh, uh, look at examples. And uh, the country from where Paul comes from, uh, the UK, is one clear example of a country that understood the specificity of its geography and that has explored this specificity to its advantage on a very uh, sound basis, uh, to say the least, <laughs> and for a long time. 
Holland is another case of a country that is uh, probably uh, uh, very small in territorial area, but has this opportunity of being in a very strategic uh, place in the North Sea and also used and explored that quite well um, with all the trade that, uh, that uh, it carried out in past centuries and still does. And of course, Portugal is also one of these examples. Uh, we shouldn't go farther than that. We are indeed a very special country. I say many times that what we have of more specific is our geography. It's not even the language, because our language is spoken by so many other countries that is not a specificity of Portugal. But we are the only European country that, if we don't count of microstates like San Marino or Monaco, is the only country that only has one terrestrial neighbor. All the other countries, even now, uh, Denmark with a bridge to Sweden has two neighbors, but we only have one neighbor, and that of course should, and it did in the past, shaped all our uh, policies and our strategies and indeed our history as well. But of course, geopolitical power in the past was found in armed fleets and in colonized territories. So what does this have to do with ocean conservation? I think this is really the question for me and the question also for somehow this debate. And, uh, and the answer, I think, is going to be very important for a country like Portugal, uh, where the ocean is again becoming a matter for political, for state consideration, where the ocean has again uh, uh, came into our strategic collective understanding of ourselves and our thoughts. Um, well, I think that the first reason why the two issues are getting closer, it's because ocean conservation, as Paul has explained, is moving higher in the international political arena. Um, let me go back to the 70s when ocean environment, the marine environment, became uh, a concern for the first time. And when we look into the works that uh, Member States of the United Nations did in uh, drafting UNCLOS, the United Nations Convention Law of the Sea, we already had, in all the delegations, people that were concerned with the future of the marine environment. So we have a chapter on this convention about marine environment with a lot of principles that are right principles, and even in the preamble saying that all the problems of the oceans are interrelated and need to be treated as a whole. So the idea of integrated management comes from there, but unfortunately, more than 50 years have passed, two generations have worked, and the issue of ocean conservation has been only going downhill. Mm -hmm. And here I'm not as positive probably as Paul, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but uh, uh, looking at what happened um, makes me think that uh, uh, this is probably the reason why the oceans are more important politically, it's because they are more degraded in environmental terms. I went to work in the United Nations in the mid-90s. And at that time, I think there were three themes that were probably on parallel terms. It was the forests, the oceans, and climate. Climate change. This was before Kyoto. So I have to say that when you look into these three agendas, what happened? Well, forest skyrocketed because of satellite technology. Countries that had huge forests could not say anymore that there was no deforestation because everyone could see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So forests became very popular among public opinion. So I'm, of, I'm from the times when Bono from the U2 and Sting would go and sing for forests along with indigenous leaders. This never happened in the oceans. We still do not have our Bono and Sting for the oceans and we don't have still our indigenous people. Climate change was a mere scientific issue at that time. It was an issue for scientists with a lot of debate. Of course, that we know what happened to climate change. Climate change moved from being a scientific issue to become an environmental issue. And it moved in the beginning of this century from being an environmental issue to become a political issue because it became first an economic issue. Mr. Stern or Sir Stern came up with its report who yeah. told us that our GDPs would shrink big time if we would do nothing about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, I have no doubts that nowadays, climate change is not a political issue. It is the political issue of the 21st century. 
And that, we might have not have realized that as well, uh, yet, that is going to, in many ways, have more importance in our lives, in our societies, in our economies than we still can understand at this moment. So, where are ocean uh, conservation on this? Uh, we are not there yet, as I said, but the issue is growing up. <laughs> and, uh, and why is it growing up? Unfortunately, for the bad reasons. It's growing up because in 2017, we had the reports of the massive destruction of coral reefs through the last El Nino. From 2015 to 2016, the Great Bay Reef lost one third of its territorial area. It seems that because of climate change as well, and because of the ocean absorbing 90% of the excess heat produced by climate change and CO2 emissions and greenhouse emissions, we are killing our corals that have been around for more than 400 million years, years so much before we do. And what is important to understand is that the impact of the disappearance of corals is going to have huge uh, repercussions for our uh, societies and our economies. Because although it's less than 1% of the area of the ocean, it's probably between 25 and 30% of the whole marine biodiversity that will disappear along with corals. Uh, then, of course, we had in these last years an uh, unprecedented succession of hurricanes in the Atlantic and uh, typhoons in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. Last year was incredible. I forgot all the names of Maria, Jose, Irma, yes. all the names of the hurricanes that, uh, what do the hurricanes do? They destroy the marine ecosystems around the islands, around coastal areas. They destroy the blue economy, the maritime economy of small island developing states and also coastal areas of large states like the US or Mexico. So they have huge impacts as well. And then of course, a very important issue came up. Plastics, yes. because plastics has a very important human factor. We have been assisting to the degradation of fisheries, marine fisheries, for decades. But as long as we have something on our plate, we don't mind. If it's not tuna, it's salmon. If it's not salmon, it will be a scabbard fish or whatever it is. But plastics, no. Plastics is another problem, because plastics, they come back to haunt us. Because they go into the trophic chain, the food chain of the ocean, and they come back in our seafood, in our precious seafood. So we will be plastifying ourselves by throwing plastics into the ocean. And that became very sexy for the public opinion, for the press. So for all these reasons, we have much more political attention to the oceans. We had the UN Oceans Conference on Sustainable Development Goal 14 in 2017. And every state came to the podium and said what they are doing and that they are planning to do to save the ocean. So there we go, it's becoming geopolitics. Uh, we, um, we at that time um, could see that pushing for ocean conservation now gives political gains in the international arena. So the things are getting together. And here Portugal probably is one of the good examples that have understood this quite earlier. When Ambassador, uh, um, Ambassador Francisco Sérgio da Costa was perm rep in the United Nations, we organized ourselves a couple of uh, important elections. Because Portugal at that time had already an agenda for sustainable development. Our agenda was not for fishing more. Actually, I think it is even important to understand that Portugal for many years was regarded as a fishing country, a fishing state. So our image was very much the image of a brother of Spain, for instance, in fishing efforts. But what Portugal managed to do in the United Nations is to understand that sustainable development of the ocean should be the key, should be the priority, and should be our agenda. I think that this agenda has been paying off very well because there are many ocean countries, starting with the small island, small island developing mm -hmm. states, mm -hmm. that indeed have looked at Portugal and the Portuguese leadership as an example, and have also allied with us on other agendas of international relations that are not connected to the oceans, but that make the oceans becoming more a geopolitical issue. Uh, now Portugal has the organization of the 2020 UN Oceans Conference, the next one that is coming. And here there is an opportunity to shape the next decade for the oceans, mm -hmm. the decade from 20 to 30. 
So of course it is very important on geopolitical terms. And I hope that by then, because I think I have exhausted already almost 15 minutes, we, I have shown that oceans, conservation political, uh, geopolitical uh, and geostrategies uh, connect and uh, are important. I even think that in the future this is going to be more so because the future of this century will be sustainable environment. If the 19th century was the century of the Industrial Revolution and of uh, capitalism and, um, and capital, and if we can think that at least in the Northern Hemisphere, the 20th century was the century of the welfare state, of the victory of political movements such as social democracy, uh, uh, Christian democracy, then this century will be the century of not social sustainability, but of environmental sustainability. Because we came to the conclusions that without the environmental sustainability, there will not be social sustainability or capital sustainability. So this is going to be more geopolitical even than now. Does this matter for Portugal? Of course it matters. I think that we have to say yes, and that we have to say a resounding yes. And why? Because even for Portugal, this is more important. All this agenda fits completely in, into Portuguese national interest in what relates, relates to the ocean. Basically because Portugal does not have a very important manufactured maritime economy. We don't have a very capital intense industrial merchant fleet yeah. or shipbuilding or other industries. But we are second to none in Europe in what relates to marine biodiversity with two marine large ecosystems, one in Iberia and the other one in Macaronesia, including the Azores and Madeira. Mm -hmm. And the future of the blue economy will be very much the blue natural capital. So the nature capital, mm -hmm. the nature-based solutions for our fighting of climate change and our decarb actions. And that's why I think that this is a win-win situation. So my last comment is, how should one develop an agenda for ocean conservation given that is so important and that might bring so many political gains? Well. Of course, I'm not going to speak about the state, and I'm not going to give lessons to any state or any country. But I can speak for the Oceano Azul Foundation. And here, we think, and we've been putting that in practice, that for the foundation, the way to do this is through cooperation. It's basically through international cooperation. And this is what we've been doing with National Geographic Pristine Seas. And this is an important part of our work. And we, uh, and I should end up by again thanking you, Paul, for coming and for helping us with this cooperation because this is the way to go. Thank you very much and for having uh, paid attention. Thank you. Um, Great thank stuff, you, Tiago. <laughs> that was also a very excellent presentation. Um, we have agreed previously that I would just ask, you know, some questions for both speakers to just kick off the debate and then we pass the floor to you. Um, so, um, two, I think that um, two questions uh, mainly have uh, arise here from both your talks. Uh, one would be uh, for Paul. Um, we, yesterday, we talked a lot about generations. This is to say, uh, the generation of our children or of our nieces and nephews, I don't have children, um, is a more, um, in terms of the environment, has a greater awareness than we do. So in that sense, what can be done mm -hmm. to help that generation be able to claim uh, what is going to be the, their world, literally, mm -hmm. and what can we do about it? Okay, this right. would be my very small question to okay. you, but don't, uh, he's going to get a very tough one as well. <laughs> uh, for Tiago, uh, we talked about geopolitics. Uh, when I look at the world from an IR perspective, from an international relations perspective, 
I see a lot of competition in terms of power when I look at the oceans. We have had a superpower that dominates the world, the United States. It has the best blue water navy that we it's, it, it'll, it will be some time before the Chinese catch up. But precisely because of one of your points, because of the degradation of the oceans, ocean resources are becoming more, uh, they, 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 they trigger greater competition. So in that sense, and taking into account all your diplomatic and many dimensions of work, do you see possible a cooperation at the level of the permanent five, mostly between the United States, Russia, and China? To my students, when we talk about, for instance, when in, within Asia, when we talk about Russia, which has a big Asian dimension, I usually joke with them and I say, you know, Russia must be the only country in the world that is praying for global warming because then it will have a big extension of its coastline and the North Pole defrozen. Okay? So in that sense, do you see this coming? Because in terms of power, when we look at the world, we see this huge competition. It's about the assets. It's about the sustainability. But it's also about power. One of the great key points of your essay was precisely to point out so many empires, so many uh, societies that triumphed in the world. Precisely why? Because they had naval power. So as you see, it's a very easy question as well. Very easy. <laughs> Paul, please. Well, thank you. And, and thanks for the opportunity to speak about future generations. Um, I've got, there's a number of things there. Firstly, to answer you, you know, Tiago, with why don't we have the Bono or the U2 or the Rolling Stones of the ocean? And it's partly because most political leaders and influencers um, for the ocean will have grown up uh, in cities or towns or anywhere, and they will have walked with their parents through parks, urban parks. They will have gone camping with their parents. They would have gone fishing from a bank in a river. They will have started to enjoy a sense of parkland and terrestrial beauty at a very young age. And then as they got older, maybe they would have been um, with you know, youth groups or school groups or been with their family again and had these more sort of distant experiences and traveled, you know, traveled to beautiful forests. And, and, and unbeknownst to them, they will have learned to like it and even love special areas. So when they are in difficult decision making, now they are in a position of influence, they have an, something within them that connects them to beautiful terrestrial areas. You know, butterflies, you know, whatever it might be. Beautiful trees, you know, massive redwoods. And what we need now is to think, how do we get future leaders of the ocean and influence of the ocean to go in the sea? You know, so I remember three years ago, I think it was, I was in Brussels and I gave a talk in Parliament about, and it was slightly tongue in cheek, as we say, a slight joke, but I made the case that every school curriculum in Europe must have scuba diving in the curriculum because I felt it was the best way to learn about anything. You know, it was the best way to learn about physics, mathematics, physical performance, science. Let's get everybody diving. So although it's impossible, there was a sense of why don't we take it as a big international social responsibility to get our young ones out in the sea early and often in the tide pools, get them out fishing, get them out diving, get them sailing, become more ocean people, become sea creatures. So that's something I think is beginning to happen. That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. You know, global leaders need to be divers, or at least part of it. And the second thing is a clear understanding of shifting baselines. Um, this shifting baselines is a, is a very powerful th thought process that, that shows that if we're not careful, every single generation expects less and less from nature. Um, and this is where, you know, people, uh, let's say me, I remember doing a lot of fishing in the Florida Keys and we used to get a lot of mahi-mahi and eat them and it was easy fishing. And you'd see the pictures on the wall of people who were catching fish and they were all say about this big. But then if you looked back at people that were there some years ago, the fish they were catching were absolutely massive and there was lots of them. Equally very happy people standing there with a cold beer and a fishing rod covered in salt, look what I caught. Then my pictures were exactly the same. And now when I look at those pictures of the Florida Keys, the fish are tiny. 
little ones. But the same pictures, a bunch of people standing there with cold wheels, really happy. <laughs> so that's shifting baselines, and we have to be aware of that so that our generations don't start to expect um, less and less. Through So that's how I feel we're going to capture future generations. And you only have to go to a school anywhere, particularly in Europe, um, all the states, and all the kids are talking about marine plastic. Yes. So luckily, we've demonstrated that we have reached that moment where we change when we have to. The situation with marine plastic is so powerful. It's in us. Um, in, um, I think it's February, I'll be going to Sweden for the UN where they're going to take some uh, tissue samples from me and some blood from me. And then they're going to tell me what my body burden is. And that's how much uh, persistent organic pollutants I have in my body as way of, of a new UN project that I'm part of. And I know that a big lump of that is going to be plastic, right? So it's in us. So it's a big motivator. If it's in us, we're going to do something about it. And the kids have got that. So okay. that's my little take on the Thank next generation. So Thank you so much. <laughs> Great. Tiago. Well, I, um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's not an easy uh, question. And, uh, I'm pleased I got my one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, um, when we look into um, world powers and the oceans, we can look from very uh, several dimensions. Mm -hmm. uh, the oceans at least have an important component in some of the biggest uh, challenges that we face in the 21st century. One is, of course, climate change, mm -hmm. as I referred, because oceans and climate change are intrinsically linked. Uh, the ocean, at the same time, mitigates a lot of climate change impacts. Yes. If it were not for the ocean, as I said, well, temperatures would be, atmospheric temperatures would be uh, impossible already we wouldn't be discussing Paris agreements and two degrees. Because as I said, 90% of the heat is accumulated in the ocean. Um, so just to give you an idea, uh, we just read the report of two Chinese scientists from the Academy of Science of China, mm -hmm. in which in a single year, I think it was 2017, the ocean accumulated the energy because of excess heat that corresponds to 600 times the energy production of China of in China. one year, of China yeah. in one year. Yeah. <laughs> so it's massive. Uh, so climate change and oceans are very important, and uh, there will be a lot of consequences for powers. Globalization is about the oceans, because globalization is about international trade. International trade travels by sea. 90% of the trade goes by sea. sea. So without the oceans, uh, there is no international trade. And that's where some of the bargaining is starting. That's mm -hmm. why the Chinese have come up with the Silk Routes and yep. the, the New Belts. That's because of oceans and globalization. Then we have energy, of course. Energy is very important. Um, the oceans are key not only to produce energy. 80% of the capex of the oil and gas industry is offshore nowadays. Mm -hmm. And because mm -hmm. of also the security of supply. We've seen what happened in Europe with pipelines coming from uh, the east and how important it is to have sustainable, safe tankers mm -hmm. to transport oil, for instance. The double hull tankers that we have in Europe nowadays after the, pristine, uh, the, um, the Prestige and the Erika uh, oil spills. Yeah. So uh, energy and oceans are also connected very much. Uh, I find very interesting when a country has energy very high in its geostrategic agenda for defense, and then the oceans are quite low on that list, which is the case of Portugal, by the way. Yes. Because <laughs> without the oceans, there is no energy case. <laughs> the oceans are key for the energy. Then, of course, the environmental sustainability. The oceans are the big ecosystem of the planet. There is no other one. If the oceans are upset in their system, well, the whole environmental ecosystem of land, of, what, of which we depend, absolutely, will be upset. And finally, there is the pure security mm -hmm. reasons. The oceans are key for security matters, as we can see in the South China Sea, but as we can see also in the Black Sea or in the Mediterranean or in other uh, oceans or in the Arctic Sea more and more, yeah. uh, or even, I would say, in, in Europe. Two-thirds of the European Union borders, two-thirds are marine borders. So for Europe, the maritime defense is probably as important as land defense. Mm -hmm. And on all these issues, we see signs of bigger tension. But this goes, unfortunately, with the whole the magnum problem of the planet in this century, which is that we have 
reduced nature to a very small part of what the planet is. And we have um, scaled up our economies and our societies to most, to, to most of what the planet is. So what is happening? It's happening what we see in the animal kingdom when you have mammals from the same species and they have to control their territories. If the territories are not overcrowded, they solve their disputes amicably. One is bigger than the other and that's enough for the other to go away. But when these territories are overcrowded, they only dis solve their disputes until one dies. Yes. And this is unfortunately the metaphor that one has probably to come about when we think about the oceans, the futures, and the lapidation of, of our planet's uh, environmental, um, environmental uh, values. Uh, then I would say just one last thing, which is so that in the ocean, this is important, the powers are not exactly as they are on land. This is very important because mm. of UNCLOS and because of EZs and continental shelves. Yep. So we cannot say that a country that is very powerful on land because it has a critical mass of land territory that is very important, like Iran, for instance, in the region where it is, or it sits, has such an importance in, on marine terms. Because, well, or a country like Germany, don't go too far. Germany has no ocean and has very little sea. But it's very important in terms of land territory in Europe and not only in terms of critical no. mass. Uh, and look at the case of Portugal. <laughs> Portugal is the 110th biggest country of the United Nations <laughs> on land territory. But on ocean territory, Portugal is one of the 15 biggest countries in the world. So that also, when we think about international relations and about powers, if we think in ocean terms, we should think on this way as well. Great. This is going to be important because if the future of our economies will be very much the bioeconomy and the environment, as I am sure it will, <laughs> well, if you have a lot of biodiversity and a lot of environment, if you are a powerhouse for environmental values, you should keep them. You should protect them. You should invest on them. Thank you so much, Tiago. That was a very good answer to my tough question. Great. Now, um, we, we give the floor to the audience. I, I, I'll ask you to uh, just present yourselves. And please, 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 please make an effort to make a brief question so that we have enough time for everybody and because Paul really has to leave and catch the plane, otherwise he will not come back to Lisbon in, 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 in this year at least. Okay, I see that lady there, yes? Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I am Maria Amelia Martins Loção. I am the president of uh, Portuguese Ecological Society. Um, I like very much uh, all these uh, topics, and um, I catch particularly uh, two words, environmental sustain sustainability, Ability. that we know that it's very important, but in a way, and being uh, an ecologist, uh, it's a little bit strange uh, to put all these aspects, because in a way, men are here and we are increasing our population. So, in a way, how can we talk about environmental sustainability when we need to feed the world? Mm. And we also know that cow production has a huge impact in uh, climate change and in also uh, the biodiversity of land. So mm -hmm. what happens to the oceans? Thank you very much. More questions, please? One more. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> My name is Arnaldo. I come from Cabo Verde, mm -hmm. which is a ocean-born nation, yes. <laughs> and some centuries ago, but now known for exporting the hurricanes to the United States. <laughs> <laughs> okay. it's, 
<laughs> it's the only export we have been able to do. No, you also <laughs> export very good football players. <laughs> and, and music. And music. music. And uh, <laughs> landscapes and, <laughs> and culture. But I, I had in my, I, I appreciate a lot what has been said. And um, my, my question is the knowledge and the sharing of sharing knowledge. Sharing of knowledge. Uh, we are in a country where a prince called João, he became the king, João II, uh, made knowledge about navigation in the Atlantic Ocean, the big, the big uh, issue for building a maritime empire. Mm. And he knew after the death of the Henry navigator that knowledge would be, knowledge to, to know how to go and come back to Portugal would be the key issue mm -hmm. for, the, for his time. And uh, I remember for, for, for my country, like, like uh, for example, the, the illegal, prevent the illegal fishing mm. is a key issue for us. And having the, the knowledge is not an easy question. Okay. And I had in mind, if it's possible to work m for us to work together more to wide open the the contacts and the knowledge and to share mm -hmm. uh, all the action has to be done thank you very much Arnaud, for your question um, who wants to go first uh, yes the, the question from you ma'am uh, it's a great question it's always on my mind because I think about overpop population regularly and it feels to me as if we're involved in some sort of out of control science experiment with the with the you know burgeoning population and all the forecasts make for pretty grim reading when you look at the, you know how many resources will we need when we're, when we're that many billion and yeah. how many resources or indeed how many planets will we need when we're when we're that many billion um, so you know this is going to be a tough nut to crack because we haven't been very successful in managing our population growth. The only place where it was successful, and I remember it well, uh, was in Bangladesh. And it relates a lot to your thing, Tiago. When you, when you put everybody together, you know, wilderness, and all the animals are in there and they get along well if there's plenty of space, because there's a bit of, so I'm bigger than you, so I'll go off. But then when you're all together, things are gonna happen. Bangladesh had the, the world's most densest population. And I remember um, doing some reporting from Bangladesh in um, 2004, I think it was. And I was sitting on a toilet in Dhaka, working out on the back of my hand. Because it said, I was going to say to the camera in, out there, the camera was out there, that Bangladesh is the most crowded place on earth. And in fact, if you took the whole of the world's population and put them into the lower 50 states in the UK, so not including Alaska and Hawaii, put them all there, it wouldn't be as crowded as Bangladesh is today. And I was there with my phone and a load of numbers and doing long division and working out per, per square meter. And it's true. That's tr that was true at the time, that Bangladesh was so dense. They had a, but their resources are very limited. And it wasn't until Mohammed Yunus, um, the great political leader and influence of Mohammed Yunus, he's the man who, you know, micro banking and all mm -hmm. the rest. And he came up with the idea that we need, he needed to communicate, get knowledge out there to somehow turn it into the single issue that would change Bangladesh. And he did it almost single handedly. And now the population growth in Bangladesh is very close to being much more sustainable. And I wonder if that's what's going to happen to the whole planet. Are we going to wait until, until we have to change? Or are we going to think about overpopulation at the same time as we think of loss of habitat, loss of biodiversity, overfishing, marine plastic pollution, all these other stresses that come in? And I think that putting them in the framework of the overpopulation is a great one because it really brings us to that obvious thing that we all know that the planet has only got so many resources. So I like it when overpopulation pops up. And David Attenborough uses it all the time. I think it's a very powerful sort of driver yeah. to help us think. So when it comes to the ocean, well, the best thing we can do is to protect what we have. 
Um, there might be this out of control experiment going on out there somewhere, but we just have to, you know, maybe it's a good driver if politically there isn't the will, if financially there are difficulties, if there's other fears about protecting the ocean, that can be a useful tool to say, well, you know, the, the, the planet is going this way, we need to protect what we have, both terrestrially and, and at sea. But it's a great comment, thank you. Yeah. Chab, do you want to? Sure, um, <clears throat> in relation to your question, um, I think that we have a problem uh, to start with. Uh, and the problem is that we already came to a point uh, in uh, where uh, it's difficult to feed ourselves, our societies, on a sustainable way. So we consume almost three times the natural resources of the planet every year. So we are consuming the future of the other generations. Next generations that will come will have no resources because we are using their resources ahead of time. Um, are we really doing this? We are completely. One of the things that, one of these figures that really uh, made me perplex recently was to find out that we humans, we are 40% of the biomass of all the mammals of the planet. Close to 40% of the biomass of all the mammals of the planet are our species. It's our species. And out of the other 60% of mammals, 70% of them are our food. <laughs> so we ate the planet. And we are now in the situation where we have ate the planet. We ate the forests to warm up. We ate the fish and the animals to feed ourselves. Um, and we are now in a situation that is going to be difficult. But the fact is that from now to 2050, we'll be 10 billion. Yeah. So at this moment, we will need at least more 30 to 40% of proteins to feed the 10 billion. How are we going to do this? Because if we do this through the traditional ways that we've been doing that, forget climate change. Because agriculture is one of the biggest contributing sectors for CO2 emissions and carbon. So uh, this is a problem. We won't be able to do that. So the vision of the Oceanus Foundation for the century, and that's where we are optimistic, <laughs> is that this century we will work tireless and with obsession in decoupling economic growth from environmental degradation. What does it take to do that? Well, it's going to take the biggest of all revolutions. We will have to change our model of economic development, not the one we are developing since the Industrial Revolution, but the one that we are developing since the Agricultural Revolution. We'll have to go beyond the Agricultural Revolution because it's about feeding people that you're talking here. And I think that we have the technology, and if we have the willingness, the political vision, we will be able to do that in the century, like we were able to do other things before. But of course, that, that makes that, that little mammals that have no useful use for us, because they are not us or our food, will be critical. We will understand that to protect them is to save us. And I think that this is what is going to happen. And, uh, and the evolution is going on that sense. So uh, I don't think that we'll have so many cows around uh, in 10, 15 years as we have now. I don't think that we'll be eating uh, so much uh, meat. I think that we'll probably eat much more algae and much more of other products that do not require fresh water products, are not produced through agricultural means, but are probably produced other ways, either in our oceans or in our labs. And, uh, and that is going to be probably the step. But of course, that takes us too much into the future. And I want to answer then the second question. Maybe I yes, can just absolutely. go to the second question. Well, the answer to your question is exactly <laughs> what I said or how I finished my introduction is international cooperation and cooperation. You are absolutely right. There is a huge inequity of know-how in the world. And uh, when we look into the oceans, uh, this inequity is part of the problem because I would say that the overwhelming majority of coastal states do not know how to deal their oceans. They don't have the scientific knowledge to understand the ecosystem-based approach that is necessary 
for your policies, for your special planning, for your managing of the ocean. Very few countries indeed have this, very few. Not, only, not all the countries of the European Union have them, by no means. So you really have to, to have this sharing of knowledge. This is called capacity building, how you do have to have this flow mm. and you have to organize that and there is no organization doing that at the mm -hmm. moment mm. and you'll have to share that knowledge. Mm. But until then, you need to save what's left, as Paul said. Yeah. So you need to do marine protected areas. We need to buy time. We need to buy time to one day uh, being able to change our economic model of development. Uh, and until then, we have to, uh, to take draconian measures in saving what's left. Mm. Uh, and if I, if I may, yes, your question is a great one because when people first look at the way we understand geography or the way we understand international knowledge, there's a sense that if people are online, they know it all. It's almost as if they've been there and done it themselves. So your, your comment is a great one because it reminds people, unless you really understand mm -hmm. the front line, really go to Cape Verde, go there, do the work, see what, see what the ocean is like, understand the field work that goes on in you, your country, you can't act on it. You, people need to be there and do it and see it. So I love that sort of comment. But you know, it also proves that it's not as easy to share knowledge as we think. You know, in my world, you think, well, it's easy. You know, we've got satellite, satellite monitoring. You know, monitoring and, and the enforcement is easy because of these international laws and all these other great things that are going to happen. But it's got to the energy for understanding it and making a difference has got to happen in country. You know, someone like, you know, us three can't suddenly arrive there and make it happen. It's got to be the will within the country, even in Portugal. I mean, the Azores won't be uh, protected until it happens within the Azorean government and the Portuguese government to make it happen. And so, you know, you outlined a great challenge. And I would say that the knowledge sharing, uh, although it appears easy these days, yes. does take a big force of will from the country. You know, you hear about satellite monitoring and, and the fact, and I, I can take you to small islands that have a laptop and they're watching vessels in their area and they can report on it and track it. It gets reported back in France, back in Britain, but, and back in the US, but they can see it actually happening. So that to me looks like a great win. And I can, you know, we can organize a team to come to you and work out how do we fund this satellite tracking and put it on your island, but it's got to come from the island. There's got to be that will mm -hmm. to make it happen. So you've outlined a great problem. And, and, you know, outside of this, I mean, right to us too, we can, you know, help make contacts and, you know, help drive that through. And it underscores what, sh what should, well, what probably will happen um, to the Azores. You know, yeah. it'll happen from this country. Yeah. Thank you so much. More questions. Younger generation. <laughs> yes, please. Ah, okay, here we go. Right. Thank you, yes. Okay, again, um, my name is Luisa and I'm an international and European law student currently on exchange here. And my question for you would be, what kind of advice would you give to the young generation and taking action and like to be most efficient? Because as you already said, the awareness is there. But then I always think like the problem is like, where do you start? Mm. And a second question is, when we uh, look at climate change in the future and see like superpowers as the US, like opting out of environmental agreements like the Paris Agreement, for example, how do you see the future of climate change when there's, there's a lot of stuff done by countries, for example, in the European Union, but then there are like those big countries like the US who, right. I mean, seem to do not care that much. <laughs> <laughs> that was such a nice way of putting it. Thank you very much. <laughs> great. Great, great question. It's a great question. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, could we have another one? Younger generation. Hello. I'm not the young generation, almost. <laughs> My name is Anna. I work for a Portuguese NGO named IMVF. I would say it's the biggest Portuguese non-governmental organization, but I will be biased, although it's true. So my question, um, the European Commission, in terms of awareness raising, campaigning and advocacy, has just stated that uh, the connection between uh, planet and people is one of the priorities. Mm -hmm. In particular, to engage uh, youth 
from 15 years old until 35 years old wow. on climate change slash climate action. I would just like to ask both speakers just one or two brief insights according to your expertise and also your life experience, how we can engage uh, youth that is so overwhelmed with information and uh, social media and what happens in the Facebook, it's the truth. How can we engage this um, target group in climate action? Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Great question. Um, yes, uh, Lisa, um, I enjoyed your one. I mean, my, my tip for how do you, in your position, influence and make change happen and make these things happen is, is it's very important that you tell your own story. You know, by, by that I mean that I always advise young ones or people of any age to get out there in the front line and have some good, meaningful work experiences in the front line. So that when you're talking to someone, you know, wearing a suit who, um, you know, he's, he's, he maybe doesn't have that feeling of, of the wet places, the ocean or the, you know, the canopy jungle or whatever it is, whatever environmental issue you're pushing, they can tell that you have. So you walk in there and you know how it works. You walk into someone's office and they've just come back from a great diving trip or they've just come back from the Wakan corridor walking and you open the office, you expect to see them and you go, holy smokes, what have you been doing? And there's <laughs> something about that look and that's a very powerful motivator and it's, it's the platform to operate from. So I would say not knowing the specifics of, of, of where you're going, but I would say absolutely get your frontline stuff going so you are that person from the front line. You're talking from person, and that makes a big difference when there's a group of you and you begin to make actions happen. And your second part of the question about um, your disappointment to see uh, big nations going back on international environmental agreements. Um, I share that frustration and I'm hoping that now we see changes in international environmental law coming up. Decisions like that are the kind of thing that get global leaders put behind those bars in The Hague, prosecuted for crimes against the environment. That's where they are going. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I know it's not gonna happen tomorrow, but I was in The Hague after the Azores expedition, and I was cycling through there, and I thought, just imagine that day, you know, where we're all in The Hague, and we'd <laughs> go up, and behind the bars, you know, there's that one man in particular, a few others, and you go, there you go, you know. <laughs> Tiago and his mates, we do have enforceable <laughs> environmental laws. So, so there you go, get yourself to the front line and keep dreaming about behind the bars in The Hague with his work. Can I just, <laughs> can I just jump in on Sorry. this one? Um, I think that, you know, um, when you look at the, the fact that, to put it nicely, the United States and the current administration has retreated itself from leadership, it's also an opportunity for others. Um, um, look at Europe, as Tiago was pointing out, and in environmental issues, particularly because it is one of the greatest sources of popular unrest in China, sustainable environment. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, uh, when you have a retreat from leadership, from the superpower we were all used to, I remember the Cold War, I remember the two Germanys, I remember the Soviet Union and so forth, uh, we were used to the United States providing that leadership. So maybe, I know it's not an easy, for Europe it's not easy at all, but it's probably a good opportunity for other strategic actors to rise. Environment is clearly one of them. Sorry. I, I would probably pick up on what you said, Raquel, and, uh, okay. and say that um, what I said in my first answer about the powers of the Security Council, that on ocean matters, uh, there are other countries that can have a leadership, and I gave the example of Portugal. Mm -hmm. um, this is the same for these kind of situations. If you look into climate change, one of the countries that is a giant for climate change leadership, it's Fiji. Yeah. Fiji was the president of COP23. And Fiji is doing a work that is unbelievable for a country that is a microstate. So... On environmental arena, the, the size doesn't matter so much as it matters probably in other arenas. 
So uh, I, I, I think that, uh, like Raquel said, there will be the opportunity for others to uh, emerge. And I think that very much the future of international relations will be even more shaped around, uh, around um, coalitions of the willing, uh, around uh, like mindness. Uh, that is going to be important, play a really important role mm -hmm. in the alliance of the future. And of course, then when I look, uh, for instance, to Portugal international relations, I realize that we don't have any particular alliances for environmental matters or for this kind of matters. Never occurred to us because it was never a political issue. Mm -hmm. But because it is becoming a political issue, we'll have to build these alliances in the future. And they might be built not with the traditional allies that we have, but with other allies. And of course, when it matters to the oceans, Norway is a clear case for Portugal, for instance, within Europe. Having said that, you also spoke about the youth, and you and I also spoke about the youth. I was going to say that my uh, answer is, uh, has three points about uh, how to engage the youth, what can the youth do. There are three points. You can vote, you can buy, and you can post. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is uh, the way. Thank you so much. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> I will be quoting this one. Yeah, yeah, very good. <laughs> very good. More questions, please. Oh, the ah, younger good. generation good. is coming up. OK. Hello, very good morning. My name is Chloe, and I have a question regarding the capacity building that you mentioned just before, I think answering uh, this question. Um, my question is, or I have two, in fact, is who should be sitting in the table when we negotiate the treaty regarding uh, Environment, who should be really? Because, for example, in my very, very small experience, uh, we talked about we tried to negotiate a treaty for um, between Timor, uh, East Timor, and Australia. Australia. Yeah. And it was really, uh, it was so complicated technically, really. Uh, so we kind of were completely depending on people who actually knew what they were talking about mm. regarding the law of the sea. So the first question is, who should be sitting on the table representing um, those countries, really? Should they be lawyers? Should they be... Uh, Scientists. Exactly. Yeah. And secondly, is there in the unit class um, uh, a positive obligation to actually negotiate? I'm sure we have very clearly an obligation to not cause any arms with our um, activities. Is there for the countries, for the states, a positive obligation to actually engage in treaty treat making in order to prevent uh, or to mitigate the problems uh, that we're causing um, in the ocean? Thank okay, you. good, good, good question. Good and stuff. there was another one back there, and I have this one. Fossil fuel exploration. Yes, because we talked about the strategic moment for Portugal to rise and, um, and to use its geography to, to rise. And to rise again. We like to say to it like this, again. to rise again. <laughs> OK, two very good questions. Who would like to start? Uh, uh, yes, great. I love the one about the who should be at the table uh, You know, when it comes to negotiations. And in, and in my dream, everybody at that negotiating table has grown up as someone close to nature. You know, they've had the, as I described, they've had the stuff of growing up in, in urban parks and traveling on to terrestrial stuff. They've become divers, they're fishermen, they're, they're sailors. They've got a connection with nature that is within them and can't be denied. So when the negotiations begin to make sense and it's all blindingly obvious, then that global leader, that influencer, she says, well, this is all making sense. We just have to do it. And then she ends up working out the legal side and all the other treaty side, but you've captured that individual or that group of individuals because they, they can see it makes sense. And then they go through the technicalities. The problem is, as you well described, when there's at the table, everybody is an expert on political process and the legal side of things, and yet probably none of them are fishermen or sailors or divers or climbers or walkers or canoers and all these other things. So I think 
although I, I often say it that, that we, we need to get young ones out there early and often engaged in uh, you know, physical engagement with the planet all the time, then I believe that it really is a big thing because then you won't be sitting with these uh, bureaucrats at these tables. You'll be sitting with people that use the bureaucracy as another step, but basically they love it. They know it and love it. So and I think it's an interesting one about, is there a requirement in UNCLOS for negotiation? I guess, is there? For negotiation about? Yeah, in, in, in the law, you mean? <clears throat> that it's a legal part? You know, I don't know. I always assumed it would be as part of the process. You may know more than, than, than we do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> we need to get you down. But it's a great, it's so to me, it's all about remembering these people have the authority and the power to make the decisions and make the agreements, but they have to mean it inside. They don't just have to be looking after their own interests, that they want to be elected again next year, or they want a safe bet against a certain group of people. Um, they have to really mean it and love it and know it, you know. Mm. So that's the next, you know. And I think that also connected to, 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 to your point is the issue of, do you have the expertise? Do you have the knowledge? Because I think mm. one of the things that clearly afflicts smaller country is brain drain, <laughs> right? So in that sense, when you're negotiating with a bigger power or a country that has mm. greater financial advantages in yeah. being able to put yeah. all of that in the table, that's when you have to call the specialists like Paul, okay? <laughs> and Tiago, please. Well, so, uh, on, 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 on more this, um, this kind of representation, uh, legal, uh, sitting at the table, that's clearly for me a question of governance, very much a question of governance. In this little essay, little essay. in uh, chapter six, it's about ocean governance. Yeah. And there, uh, this was already many years ago, I made my vision very clear. And my vision is that uh, we are still managing public affairs like Napoleon did. Because if you look into the Council of Ministers of Portugal or any continental mm. European country nowadays, apart maybe from the environment, most of the other uh, areas, portfolios, already existed at the time of Napoleon. And so we continue to look into our right. public affairs on a very vertical, anthropocentric view. You know, it's justice for men, it's uh, the economy, so money for men, things like that. Uh, so we need totally, I think in the future as well, to start working in different terms in governance ways. And so in the ocean, it's quite clear a case that demands, that cries for that horizontal governance because the ocean has impacts in all different portfolios. It has an impact on the economics, so the Ministry for Economy, on energy, on tourism, on foreign office, uh, on international relations, therefore, on environment, uh, on fisheries, on transport, on transportation, shipping. So who is going to take care of it? And the fact is now is that it's very difficult because in many countries you have a minister for environment that wants to protect the ocean very much and then you have a minister for fisheries that wants to protect the fishers. Mm -hmm. And this is what happens. So you go to a meeting for fishers and quotas in the European Commission and the Minister for Fishers goes there and brings all the fish he can bring to the country. And then you have the Minister for Environment saying, no, we shouldn't f should preserve our biodiversity and our marine, blah, blah, blah. So, of course, there is a huge work that we need to do in civilization terms. The ocean has a blue part in different ministerial portfolios. And we will only be able to do this step when you'll have an integrated maritime policy and the government that realizes that all the different ministers of the different portfolios mm. no, need to know their part in that uh, ocean uh, policy, in that ocean area. So the Minister for Transports needs to know what to do about marine transport. Because I cannot remove maritime transport from the other modes of transport. Like it's done. Even in Portugal it's done because the Ministry of the Sea has transportation. Because, of course, transportation needs to go in the intermodal connection yeah. with rail and road. So I think that we need to invest more in the software rather than in the hardware. Having said this, it's of course that it's clear that we work in silos. And it's the same in Portugal or in any European country, which is 
uh, we work on climate change under the UNFCCC. The UNFCCC, it's run and negotiated by people from the Ministry for Environment. But the ocean has a huge impact in climate change. But people from ocean do not go to the meetings of the UNFCCC. <laughs> they go to UN meetings. Yeah. So what we did in great cooperation with the Ministry for Foreign Affairs uh, uh, just last week, the Portuguese mission at the United Nations organized a, a meeting between a group of friends of the ocean with the permanent reps that are part of this group and the member states that are leading the ocean agenda on the UNFCCC, on climate change. Mm -hmm. Because they have never talked to each other. Mm -hmm. So there's a long way in terms of this governance and uh, that needs to be done in terms of domestic governance and international so governance. governance. Uh, that's well, for that's, sure. That's a very, very good point, right. Tiago. So um, maybe just I would answer something oh, sorry, in relation to, uh, to you, to your comment about uh, uh, oil uh, in the coast of Portugal. Um, well, I can only speak for the foundation. And the foundation has a vision, as I said, that uh, we'll be able to decouple economic development from environmental degradation. Because so far, since the Industrial Revolution at least, these two have been hand on hand. Mm. We create growth, economic growth, but there is always an impact on the environment. Much more even. I like to say this one, which is a bit like, you know, the Brits say that uh, football, it's 11 against 11 with a ball in between. And Germany And wins. in the end, Germany always wins. In the wins. end, Germany always wins, yes. Well, <laughs> it's very true. <laughs> environment and the economy is the same thing. Uh, it's a game where you have environment and economy on both fields, and in the end, the economy Me always wins. wins. Yeah. Good. So uh, <laughs> we think that in the end, the game must be, in the, in the future, the game must be different. And so we need to decouple this. And I gave some tips about how we would decouple that in the future. Um, uh, so of course, our vision is that uh, as a foundation, we are promoting ocean conservation. And at the same time, we are also promoting the other side of the coin, which is a new paradigm for a blue economy. That's why we have a program like the Blue Value, Blue Bio Value, that, by the way, was launched yesterday, <laughs> where we are investing in companies, in startups, in entrepreneurs that want to develop business out of nature-based solutions. And that capitalize on the natural capital. They do not spend the natural capital, but they capitalize on it. So this is our way. And of course, I would say that oil is not included in this way. I'm not speaking for the state as well, because I'm speaking for the foundation. When I look at states, I see that there are many different options. Uh, for instance, uh, we can look to Norway, which has a huge exploration of oil and gas. Uh, they have more than 160 uh, wells of oil and gas active, which is the number one country in human development in the yes. world, but which is also looking into new ways of uh, of diversifying their economy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, each, each, each state has its own, uh, yeah. its own option. Uh, so and I, in, I'm not going to, uh, no. to interfere with that. Even in their sovereign fund, which they use to, yeah. they have been diversifying all investments That's and not, right. not being so dependent on, on oil. But also Saudi Arabia is doing that. Yeah. Different ah. levels of human development, and I shall say this, at some point, particularly because I am a woman. Be careful, you might <laughs> yes. be higher. You might be higher. They are hiring scholars from all over the world and are developing their educational university system in a huge I'm ways. I'm all for that, but that. their starting point is so low. <laughs> yeah, okay. Wow. I'm all for that. Um, I have a young man from, who has not given up in raising his hand, so. Great. This is good. I'm really good. My question yeah. is probably answered. But uh, my name is Yola. I'm an international relations student. Where from? From the Netherlands. Oh. I study here in Lisbon. And um, I've been wondering, um, growing up in the Netherlands, uh, a lot of people talk about um, these projects on sustainability, especially concerning the water. We call it the fight against water. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> but um, there's, for instance, a young man who developed, um, um, who funded this Taoji cleanup. Um, He's only, I think, 18 years old when he, when he funded it. it he's yeah. developing advanced technologies to rid the world um, oceans of plastic. 
And I'm wondering, since I've lived abroad, I noticed that not many other people are talking about it. Mm -hmm. And my first question would be, what are other countries taking a leadership role in these projects? And what would be a platform where they can share their expertise? Good question. Thank you yeah. very much. Great. Here, please. We have to, to balance gender. <laughs> Great. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Robert Limbo. I'm from Nepal. And Nepal. Yeah. Good. I'm an international student from Iskite. Uh, I don't have really questions, but I just came in. And it just came in mind, like like Nepal is a landlocked country. We don't have ocean. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about ocean, I just came to feel about our mountains, which are melting, and the glacier. There are many glaciers which are about to explode somehow. Uh, so when we talking about sustainability of the oceans, I just came to, uh, I think we start to think about those poor snows which are, they are melting and <laughs> the, those mountains. So just comments, not really. Thank and you very much. I, I, I think maybe we should have taken some initiatives, or is there already some initiatives that's going on? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Ah, thank thank you. you very much. So, so j just to make it clear, your point is on sustainability in general, not just the oceans, but mountain uh, climate uh, change, warming, and melting of assets? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So, Netherlands, Nepal, who wants to go first? <laughs> I, I like your comment about Netherlands because that, that, that those projects have got a huge amount of visibility, haven't they? And um, it, it's clear to me that there's lots of other great stuff going on from other countries. And it does seem a bit bemusing. You think, ah, that's back on, back on BBC again. And, and I reported on it. I did the, um, the story on, you know, when did, it go, when did it go to sea in the Pacific, the big float? Yeah, that's right. And, and I remember doing some reporting on it for BBC, and, and, it, and it, you, you just assume, well, I assumed at the time, we'd see loads more all sort of, you know, using that moment. But we haven't, and it's still, a, you know, it still seems to be that that seems to be holding the limelight better than other projects. So I expect that this sort of project leadership acts as a good beacon and a good example of what can be done to other people. Mm. We just maybe don't hear about it so much because people get... Sometimes journalists are lazy. We have an ocean story. Oh, what was that one that we did last month? Ah, yeah, and they replay it. And people get it, and then they realize that perhaps your colleagues are great um, interviewees on the subject and make a phone call, it's a nice, easy piece of journalism. But once something gets the public's imagination and the media's imagination, it sticks, doesn't it? You know. So I think there is a huge amount of technological advances and leadership and innovations and fabulous ideas coming internationally for ocean sustainability, but, uh, but it brings the point that sometimes we just don't hear about them. Seems crazy. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I would probably, uh, I, 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 think, I think very much the same. I think that it is an incredible example of how one person can make a difference. Yes. So that case of Boylan in the Netherlands of that uh, come up with the idea of recovering plastic from the surface mm. of the Pacific Ocean. By mm. the way, I think that the testing now is going on uh, in San Francisco mm -hmm. about this. So mm -hmm. it's yeah. kicking off this yeah. project after, I think, more than 18 million fundraising. Uh, it's mm -hmm. a great project. And I was very elliptic when I answered that uh, the way to act is to vote to a shop or to buy and to post. post? Uh, uh, but one person can really make a difference. It's amazing. Mm. This is a clear case of that. I, um, I think that... Uh, in a way, uh, nowadays, I, I, I'm very also optimistic in relation to new generations, I have to say, because yeah. when you look into millennials, they are very different already from my generation. My generation <laughs> is the worst of all generations. But absolutely, you know, I grew up in the 80s and uh, graduated in the beginning of the 90s. And at that my generation's time, the paradigm for a youth, a younger in, uh, in Europe, would be to become a yuppie. Yes. Yuppie. <laughs> Yuppie would be a rich banker and accumulate money and have a very successful career. Huh? Yeah. Remember London? Uh, certainly do. Yuppie. Yes. And uh, everyone wanted to do that. So no one had any goals or any visions or any ideals but to get rich. And I think that we did that in our generation. Not get rich, but, <laughs> but not having ideals. 
and uh -huh. uh, we contributed a lot because yeah. we knew already of the problem, contrary probably to the previous generation, we mm -hmm. knew and we did nothing. Yeah. yeah. And we did nothing. Your generation is different because I think that you already feel that you need to do something because this is going to be your upbringing and the future. And, uh, and so that's why I think that uh, the relationship with nature that your generation has is very different from ours. That's much more people are vegetarian because they respect nature. Mm -hmm. They respect themselves, but they also respect nature. Mm -hmm. They respect animals. They think that they should do different. And I think that is even an instinct of survival that we have in our yeah. genetic code yeah. Uh, yeah. as a species that will make this change. But one thing is clear, we will completely change our relationship with nature during this century. We will fundamentally understand that you are not above nature and that we'll be part of it. That we are not the homo deus of Ariri book, yes. as we spoke. Yes. Uh, because we'll start suffering the consequences. We are already doing that. And that is true for the Netherlands and sea level rising or for Nepal and uh, glacier uh, melting. melting. Not going to be different because we have affected the whole system of land by now. And so uh, it's not different. You don't have safe havens, I'm afraid. Uh, there are places that are more severely hit than others, but you don't have safe havens. So action is to be carried out throughout the planet. Right. Yeah, um, yesterday when we were talking about this, and I think that the key word was, I think it was you who said it, it's humble. Yes. We need to be <laughs> humble. We need to stop being so arrogant and looking at nature as something that we command and can exhaust at all times. Mm -hmm. We need to be humble. But, but you know, we have a fundamental cultural problem to do that. Yes. Because... All our existence, since at, since at least 6,000 years ago, 60,000 years ago, mm -hmm. is a fight, a struggle against nature. Yes. We were very small. 60,000 years ago, we were less than 1 million people in the planet. So it was the opposite of what I said. When I said we ate the planet, it's because we are 7 billion. When we were 1 million, nature was overwhelming. That's why we still think that nature is for free, because at that time, it was overwhelming, it was endless. Mm -hmm. We could not do anything that would probably, possibly impact on nature. So it was for free. The problem is that in our mind, nature is still an enemy to a point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cold, heat, uh, rain, uh, wind, uh, animals. And at the same time, we, um, we, we look at it as something that is still as meaningless as this glass of water. If you look into our legal systems and the way we consider nature, nature in our legal systems, nature in the civil law legal system of Europe is considered a thing. Yes. Article 202 of the Portuguese Civil Code. So nature is not considered a value. It's mm -hmm. considered a thing. It's not considered an asset. Mm -hmm. Also for a traditional economist, nature doesn't value anything. What it values is our manufactured products. So you see the long way that you'll have to go culturally to, to be, be stripped of this humbleness, to be stripped of this arrogance. Yes. It's going to be a long, long way. Okay. Good man. I think we have time for one more question. There was a lady there, somewhere there, that I think has given up. You have given up? <laughs> no more questions? No okay. people with other views? <laughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Katerina, I'm a student. Um, my question is, uh, we've been talking about uh, the younger generations, but as uh, Tiap said, the younger generations are more prone to awareness in the, in the recent years. But how do we, as a younger generation, approach the older Generation. The more experienced generation <laughs> will get you a get yeah. better feedback. <laughs> That's a uh, who isn't as educated uh, in this matter? I don't mean the, the ones who are, as you said, sitting at the table, but for example, the fishermen and, uh, for example, our parents and our grandparents 
who don't seem to understand what is happening to, to our planet. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. your question. Great. Paul. This one yeah. is definitely oh, for you. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, I think, um, again, it's, as I said earlier, it's about getting out there yourself and having you know, meaningful experiences to, to gather your opinion as to what's going on. So let's just say it's climate change or it's overfishing or you know, loss of habitat. You need to be out there and have seen it for yourself because I find it much easier when I'm reviewing a grant application um, for an expedition if that person really has been there and knows it and does it. Um, that carries a lot more weight and influence and, and respect from, from my team if we go, well, she's, she's been there, she's studied mm -hmm. it, she lives it, she knows it, than perhaps someone who comes in with, uh, on the face of it, a more beautiful application and even showing up with a designer suit and all these other things, and this person's an expert at going for grants, but we realize that this person has got all their knowledge from the internet or academic study. And all of a sudden, we lose interest. Yeah. So when you are trying to influence um, you know, uh, parents, fishermen, other people who have done this for many, many years, maybe even for generations, one has to be very careful how we approach. And the mm -hmm. safe ground is that when I was six, I was swimming here and seeing loads of fish. Now I'm 30 and I'm not seeing anything, and I'm seeing stacks of plastic. Um, so what's going on? What can we do about it? That's, that's a much safer, more effective ground than, you know, I've just got this off the internet, look what's happening around the world. So that, that sort of guidance, you know, yeah. Great. I have two more questions. Yes, ladies first. Great, yes, of course. You know, I'm very interested, my name is Catalina. I've been working uh, at the same time of uh, Tiago uh, in the United Nations. I was involved in the negotiation of Agenda 21, and I, by chance, I was on the chapter Oceans. 17. At that time, I did not know anything about oceans or what is represented. <laughs> so I know that I love ocean, as Tiago knows very well. Uh, but knowledge about oceans I did not have. Mm. But at that time, it was happened that uh, I understood how important it was and how the, uh, con the countries could manage in their interest the oceans. And the result is maybe not the, the most interesting one, but at least open the door and open, open the window for what we are speaking here. I have just another, not question, I'm sorry, I don't ask question because I'm ignorant, but no. I just uh, say to the young people that have been speaking, just one word. They have something to do, is maybe uh, changing the culture that they have been learning along with their parents, and instead to stay too much time uh, in front of it, a TV or in front of a computer <laughs> looking for some games, maybe they can see uh, movies on oceans and how, what is represented and see some experience of people like Paul and understand what they can do from there on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, last question, please. There. Okay, okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Fernand. Uh, good day. My name is Fernando Jorge Cardoso. I, I, um, I teach and I also work at the Lisbon Club. And uh, I, I was also working on the organization of this event. Mm. Um, I have one point before Putting the point, uh, if, I, if, Thiago, if we could rename the, the title of this Lisbon talk, I would pick your, your words and I would call it The Nature is Voting. Because it is. Or, taking up from Raquel, the referee is showing a red card. <laughs> 
<laughs> he knows I love football. <laughs> Having said that, my point is that uh, we have uh, received one, 100, 155 registrations of people interested to come to this event. And uh, I have made the statistics of the kind of people that registered. Some of them are not here because the traffic in Lisbon it's is chaotic. chaotic. Yeah. It's not a lack of interest, I believe. At least I'm optimist also, I believe. <laughs> but looking at that, that uh, most were students. See, and the different. list were people from media. Two. I don't know whether they are here. Within the Lisbon Club, we have 100 members, uh, we have 1,000 journalists. I don't know whether some of my club member journalists is here. What I want to say is not to blame the journalists. What, what <laughs> I want to say is that the span of time that we have before nature is this more disrupted cannot wait for the next generation in power. It has to be this, yours, probably mine, generation that is in power now, that has really to change the area. And the media has a very important uh, point and task in this. Mm. Because when we read in Portugal, newspapers listen to the radio and see TV Usually, what is there are, of course, the diversion. But when we listen about news, the news are about um, pity, political struggles, crimes, and domestic sins, and a little of violence and sex sometimes. Global challenges, those challenges that affect us are not present in the media. So my point is, for us, all of us, younger and less younger, <laughs> okay, is that we do not have time to wait for better people or other people to come and rule, to come and notice. They have to be those that are there. And our point is that, I pick up what you said, really what we have is to vote and to boo. <laughs> okay? This is not really a question, but that's something that I felt compelled to, to say. say. And just a little joke. You said, ladies first. Coming from Africa, we usually say, ladies first, but men before. <laughs> <laughs> and I could okay. go on about commenting on the situation in Africa, but I will not do that. <laughs> now, I think we have these really two great comments. I don't know, I don't, I don't know if you have something to say, um, you well, would like to say. On, on the media, for sure. I mean, you know, I work in the media, and, and you're absolutely right. We have a lot to answer for on this. And I sometimes jump out of my skin where on page five of a newspaper, it says there's water on Mars. Yeah, exactly. You know. And you go, why is that on, and it's this big on page five. And on page two, it's some horrible soap uh, opera, yeah. television news or something. Yeah. So yes, I agree with the media. I think we can do a lot better uh, the way we manage our, our affairs in the media, absolutely. Um, so, but thanks for your comments, thank you. I, I wanted to make a final comment, and it's very much about also for the, the younger crowd that is uh, attending this, this, it's for all, but I think that there has been a lot of questions from, from you about what can we do, or how can we act, and. I don't think that it is for me to tell you how you should act because you act on even different ways that my generation did. Absolutely. So I wouldn't be able to give you a good advice, but I think that you will understand. It's going to be an intuition that will come to you and you will act as you think that is fit and you'll find out that very well. I think that important to understand is that there is a process and we need, first we need the information. That's why we need the media because without information there is no awareness. 
But with information, we might become aware, but aware is not enough. And I think that at this moment in our societies, even in Europe, we are at the level of awareness. But you need to move from awareness to conscience. And conscience is another step forward. It's when you are conscient that then you are able to be mobilized to causes. And mobilized is not enough because mobilized has to end up with action. So there are processes here and steps. But I think that, uh, as uh, you said, Fernando, the younger generation will not be able to wait for the older one to keep doing business as usual. And they will act. They will act because it's on their interest. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Good. Thank now, you. before we end, I'm going to take some liberty and uh, some liberties here. I would like to end this wonderful debate with two world-class experts <laughs> on these matters. Really, I, I'm so, I'm, I was so happy when at the board I was chosen to moderate this debate. You wouldn't believe it. I want to end with a quotation from the Green Book that Tiago uh, has put in his essay. Blue Book? Oh, no, Green Book. The ah, Green ah, Book. The Green, the Green of the European Commission. And it was for me something absolutely... Um, I was dumbfounded that you could find almost poetry in something written by the European Commission. <laughs> okay? So, I hope I do it justice. The European citizens have grown with the stories of the great explorers that have enabled us to understand that the earth is round and that have taught us to know the exact location of the continents. Many of them enjoy their holidays by the seaside in the midst of the busy fishing ports tasting seafood in restaurants and spending by the seaside their walks uh, avoiding the splash of the waves. <laughs> Some spend their hours observing the colonies of sea uh, birds or the whales or waiting for the fish to bite. Others spend their free times restoring or navigating in old boats made of wood. This is my husband's dream. Others still like to watch the documentaries about the dolphins or the penguins in television or in the movies. Some will work in all these activities. Others will be fishermen. Others will be port captains. Others will work in tourism in all these seaside cities. But how many of them actually are aware and conscious that all these activities are interconnected? How many have the conscience that they are citizens of a Europe that has a sea? Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.